Okay, hello bearded bee people. Welcome back to Bee K Bees for more of our second part of our beekeeping crash course. This part is on managing your bees, how to be a good beekeeper. And this video is on getting started with your bees. So, the, as I've said in many, many videos, there are a lot of areas of concern. There are big pitfalls that you have to avoid. There are a lot of common mistakes that beginners make. This can all be worrying. This can, this can cause concern as you're getting started, but I really don't want this to be a fearful thing. I don't want to instill fear in you. Uh, some mistakes are going to be made, but there's a lot of good information out there, and this presentation should contain a lot of good information to help you avoid a lot of those pitfalls. So try not to... Uh, get too concerned with all of that talk. So here are some pictures to kind of add uh, emphasis to the point that beekeeping is a lot of fun. Some pictures of me being goofy. It's a picture of a beautiful bee yard on probably like a July day where the bees are just so busy bringing in nectar that they do not care at all what anybody else is doing. These are great days to be a beekeeper. These are awesome times when you go out and just hear the buzz and everything's just going wonderfully. These are really good, fulfilling times that uh, you should hold on to and, and enjoy because as I said, there are some frustrations as well. So, hive equipment. Uh, there are a lot of new kind of beekeeping inventions and there are a lot of niche things that are happening. Some people are using Langstroth, like horizontal Langstroth hives. People are using Warre hives. Uh, we've got the Flow hive now. All these things can be kind of uh, enticing. They can look really neat and think that it's a, a really, really awesome idea. But generally in my beekeeping operation and in my interactions with beginning beekeepers, I always suggest the industry standard uh, Langstroth setup. So this is the type of equipment that you're going to see beekeeping tutorials in and that you're going to see the vast majority of beekeepers use. So it's the industry standard for a reason. And uh, a lot of the things that deviate from the industry standard do that for more of a gimmick than uh, a usual, like a, a practical application or a practical benefit. So when you're getting started, I highly, highly urge you to uh, use the industry standard Langstroth setup. And then that still doesn't completely make the decision for you because then you have to decide whether you want to use shallower boxes and you have to decide how many frames you want per box. Um, so this is completely, completely up to you. Uh, if you have concerns about um, picking up heavy boxes, then I would suggest, at least for the honey area, using shallows or mediums. Uh, if you don't have concerns picking up heavy boxes, then you could do what we do, and that's run all deeps. But once again, my, my advice to you in this regard is to use the industry standard Langstroth setup and to make your decision on the frame depth and the frame amount based on what you feel comfortable lifting and what kind of equipment you want your bee yard to be filled with. <clears throat> Okay, so I go into a little bit more depth in terms of a recommendation in the slides. And of course, the link to the slides is in the video description below. Um, but if you want a, a clear cut, don't want to look into it, I just want Brett to give me a recommendation, then my recommendation to you would be to use the deep boxes, 10 frame boxes for the brood area, and to get two of those per hive and then to use the shallow boxes for your honey area and to get probably three or four of those per hive. That is the absolute industry standard. It will prevent you from having to lift any incredibly heavy boxes and it will keep you in the ability to sell and purchase nukes. Uh, it's just a, a really good at least starting point uh, where you can become more familiar in your beekeeping practices and make your more uh, personalized equipment choice uh, a little bit later on. So two deep 10 framers for the brood area and three or four shallow 10 framers for the honey. Now mentioning honey and the honey area in the hive, uh, the next logical conversation to have is 
should we use a queen excluder or no? Um, and the answer to that is, if you don't mind going through your honey boxes and pulling them all out and looking for brood, then no, don't use them. Uh, if, if that doesn't bother you, the possibility that a couple of frames in a honey box might have a little bit of brood at the bottom of them, then don't worry about the queen excluder because it's just more hassle. And if the, like I said, if pulling a couple of brood frames out of your honey box doesn't bother you, then the hassle isn't worth it. If you have more than just a couple of hives or you really, really want the ability to completely el eliminate brood or eggs in your honey area, then a uh, queen excluder is definitely a good idea. Uh, and then in the queen excluder realm, we've got a few different options. Huh, so here are a couple of queen excluders. You can see this one is plastic and flimsy, and this one is wood bound with metal grate. Uh, this one is much more expensive. These ones are like three or four dollars. I own probably 300 of these, and I wish I'd never bought a single one. Um, I wish I had spent a little bit more money and invested in these nice wood-bound ones. The reason for that is honey boxes are heavy, and during the honey portion of the season, everything's sticky, everything sticks together. And when you've got a flimsy, flexible queen excluder, Underneath a heavy honey box and above a busy brood box, if it sticks to both boxes as you're removing it, it can cause a real problem. Uh, so I've caught a lot of stings because of uh, troublesome boxes that just were not easy to get off because of these queen excluders. As opposed to the wood bound ones where you can just crack them free on all four corners with your hive tool. So if you are only purchasing a few of them and you really want the best in terms of usability, then get a wood-bound metal grate queen excluder. If you are budget-minded like me and don't mind wrestling crazy heavy honey boxes off a hive and trying to avoid stings, then sure, buy the plastic one. Regardless of all that though, all of these queen excluders will keep all of the brood out of your honey area and uh, that they're all good and they all work okay and now on to feeding your hive what type of feeders should you get the vast majority of beekeepers as they start out start out with the boardman entrance feeder and what that is is a little device I think I have one in the shed let me go grab one okay so a boardman entrance feeder is just this. It's a little plastic or wood device that holds a quart jar uh, that has holes knocked in the lid. It holds it upside down in the entrance of the hive. This is okay. I mean, it works. We use them, obviously. Uh, but you have to fill these up about every single day during the portion of the season that you do have to feed your bees. Uh, you know, beginning beekeepers are astounded uh, every time, every year I, I have be beginning beekeepers that just cannot believe how much syrup their hives will drink because they have to get out there filling this up once or twice a day. And uh, for that, that is enough reason for me to not use these at all. Um, but there's more. There are more reasons. Uh, the other one being fairly obvious after you've dealt with bees for a while, and that is it's not a great idea to place a bunch of enticing food directly at the entrance of a hive, especially if that hive is in any way uh, diminished in their capacity to defend. And usually when we're starting out packages, they don't necessarily have a crazy amount of workforce that has the great ability to defend their hive to all of the would-be robbers. So for that reason, I say do not get these, they're cheap, and they're effective and, and people use them, but there's problems with them all over the place. So I say avoid those entirely. A much, much better option for you are these. And this is a frame replacement feeder. As you can see, it holds a lot more than a quart jar. You can fit a little bit more than a gallon in here. And it takes up the space of one frame inside the hive. So it'll sit right there. And what I do with these is I fill them with either straw 
or pine straw, pine needles. Fill them up to the point where you're certain that there's not any open lakes of syrup there. They all have pine straw or straw for the bees to land on and walk on. And then just fill it up with syrup. This allows you to only feed, you know, maybe once or twice a week and it keeps the food away from the entrance in the hive where only the bees who need it can get it. And I just think that that's a, a much, much better method of feeding. Now I have another idea uh, that I use in the fall when I don't want to take up the place of an extra frame. And that is what I call a hillabilly hive top feeder. And that is essentially a container That is essentially a baking container like this up above a, uh, an inner cover surrounded by a shell box. Now this is, it works. Um, I'm trying to get away from this because I hate buying these and they're very brittle and they don't work for very long. Uh, so my recommendation to you beginning beekeepers, especially if you're going to be using two 10 frame deeps for your brood area which leaves you more than enough room to not have to worry about pulling out a frame to replace it with this. Uh, my recommendation is to get this type of feeder, a frame replacement feeder. Uh, so yeah, fill it up with pine straw or straw, and then you can add in a gallon or a gallon and a quarter of uh, syrup. And these are just great. Okay, so if you still want more direction and you want a more thorough explanation of all of the equipment choices you have as a beekeeper, I wrote an article uh, in like 2016 or something like that on that subject exactly, and you can see that article at the link in the description. <clears throat> okay, so now purchasing or acquiring bees, um, you generally get bees in one of two ways if you're purchasing bees, and that is as a package or as a nuke. Um, I, I generally recommend nukes to new beekeepers for a few different reasons. It usually pairs you up with a local beekeeper, a local nuke provider, uh, not necessarily as a, a partner in beekeeping, but at least that's a, a, an experienced beekeeper in your area that you know now. Um, so not only that, but these are local bees that deal with your local climate and your local conditions. Um, and they're a hive that is many steps ahead of a package. So a nuke is, it's short for nucleus colony. And what that means is the small center core of a colony of bees. And this is an example right here. Obviously, I don't have any bees in here, but this is how you'll get them. And this is how we sell them. Uh, this is a plastic, corrugated plastic nuke box, and it contains five frames. Generally, in as you buy a nuke, three of these frames would be covered with brood and bees, one would be covered with food, and one would be blank or being worked on by the bees. Um, it would contain a laying queen, tons of brood, and all types of food that your bees will need. So as I said, this is just a small starter colony of bees. Generally, you can get these for around $150 to $225, so they're a little bit more expensive than a package, but there are a lot of advantages that I had touched on just a second ago. Now, this is a package. This is what uh, bees come in as a three-pound package. I've been using this as a shaker box for the last couple of years, so generally you won't find old pieces of duct tape on the bottom of them, but, uh, but yeah, this is a package box. And inside this, when you buy a package, will be three pounds of bees, a queen in a queen cage, and a big jug of corn syrup. Um, so I think I have a picture of package bees that I can show you here in this slideshow. But yeah, this is a package box. And the process of installing bees is essentially that you just dump them out. Uh, but as you can see, there's no frames, there's no brood, there's no food in combs, there are no combs that have been drawn out. So this colony has a lot more work to do to get started in building up than this colony. Now a benefit to this method, the package method, is that you can get these for around $100 to $130 as opposed to $150 to $225. 
So this is a definitely more economical method. Uh, a drawback is usually that these will not come from your local area. Unless you live in southern Georgia or California, uh, these are going to be shipped in from our you know, beekeeping centers of America. So these are not local bees, they're cheap. Uh, they're a few steps behind uh, in terms of the beekeeping season when compared to a nuke. Uh, but so, like I said, you know, almost everything in, in beekeeping has pros and cons, advantages and disadvantages. Uh, so you can kind of make your decision as to which method you want to choose based on all that information. Okay, and then catching a swarm is another method of acquiring bees. As I said in the previous video, don't consider the, that swarm to be local bees because most colonies in your area are managed colonies, and most managed colonies are imported colonies. So, uh, although you know you do have the, the the slight chance that it is some remarkable colony that had spent the last five years in the hollow of a tree, uh, you have a much much greater chance that they left some beginning beekeeper's hive as they are making beginning beekeeper mistakes. So not that, I'm not saying that swarms aren't a great thing, awesome free bees, uh, but they are not the wonderful, wild, resilient creatures uh, that a lot of beginning beekeepers think swarms are. Okay, and so here's a picture of an active nuke uh, that was in a box just like this. It was sitting right over there a couple years ago. That is what a nuke will look like when you purchase one. Here's a picture of a three pound package with actual bees in it. Um, all right, and so now we're going to talk about installing your bees. To install a nuke, the only thing that you really have to understand is that bees orient to a spot. So when you set this nuke down, if you had just brought it from your nuke provider and set it into your yard, and if the entrance is open and these bees can fly, the first thing that they're going to do is fly out of the hive and fly in concentric circles around it, orienting to that spot. So now if two days later you come and take this group of bees and move them 50 yards down the road or down your yard, the bees that have oriented to this spot are going to return to this spot. So you really do have to be mindful of that when you're bringing your nuke home. Uh, so that not to say that that's a, a big problem that you have to avoid. It's just to say that you should set your nuke in the location that you want the full-size hive to exist. So don't let them get oriented to one spot of your yard and then set them in a full-size hive at a different spot of your yard because you're going to lose a lot of bees that way. Um, so generally, my advice is to bring your nuke home, open up the entrance when you set them down in the final location. Then, after a couple of days uh, for, you know, with which that they could get acclimated and the chaos kind of mindset can die down, then get back into your bees, move your nuke off to the side, move your 10 frame equipment back in that same exact spot, and then take your frames out one by one, placing them into the full size equipment that is in the same spot that they've oriented to. Then you're not gonna lose any bees and they'll all be happy and build up in their final location. So that is my advice and my how to install nukes. Now, installing packages. This says it's a more involved process and it is, um, but it's not difficult in any way. Uh, I know a lot, of, a lot of people have created methods uh, and devices to prevent having to do what I'm going to tell you to do, but I promise you what I'm going to tell you to do is not in any way going to hurt these bees. Um, but yeah, so generally the method is uh, you've got to shake these bees out of here into their hive, into the box that you plan on them building up in. And so... What you'll find when you get your package is it will have a wooden, uh, a little wooden, a little piece of wood here covering the top that you'll have to use your hive tool to pry off. And so you'll pull that piece of wood off and set it to the side, and now you have access to the feeder container. 
And you take that feeder container out, and what I do is take the feeder container out and quickly replace it with that piece of wood, set the feeder container off to the side, and then come back in and pull the queen cage out. The queen cage will be stapled to the wood, and so you pull her out, and then once again place that wood back so that the bees cannot get out. So you set the bees without their queen back down on the ground, and you go to the hive. Pull out a central frame, and place the queen right in the center of the central frame. Then take a rubber band and rubber band that queen cage right to the center of that frame. Now you can set this frame to the side for a second and remove a few more frames out of the hive. Now you have four frames removed from this box and you can go back to your package and smash it on the ground. And the reason that you do that is all the bees are holding up onto the top and you really want them to be dislodged and put to the bottom of the package. Now, once again, you're going to think, wow, this is really crazy. This is a violent way of dealing with these bees. And yeah, it's not, I'm sure the bees don't love it, but they're not going to die. And taking a more gentle approach is going to take a lot more time and you're going to have a lot of confused bees flying in the air that don't know how to get back to their hive because they've not oriented to that spot yet. So it is on you to be quick, thorough, and complete uh, with, you know, force to get these bees from this box into this box as quickly as possible with as few bees flying out as possible. So like I said, smash it onto the ground to dislodge those bees to the bottom of the package and then just dump. You just shake and then you smash them down into a corner and shake again and then set it off to the side and start replacing the frames. Now you want the frame with the queen to be directly in the center of the box surrounded by that mass of bees you just shook. So what I do is I place in the outer frames, place the queen frame right in, snug that up, replace that last frame, cover it up, put the cover on, put your rock on top of the cover, and walk away. Um, like I said, that's a lot of jostling, and, it, and it's quite chaotic, and it might seem cruel, but if you don't do it that way, you're going to lose a lot of bees to the air, and they do not know how to get back to this hive, and you're also going to have to do a lot more shaking, which will cause even more of that chaos and, and violence that you're trying to avoid, and you're going to increase the risk of getting stung the more times you've got to try to shake those bees out of that box. So be forceful. I mean, don't be viol unnecessarily violent, but definitely smack them down pretty good and shake with force uh, enough to get those bees out quickly. So the first month for your nuke, obviously, like I said, you're going to put them in their full-size hive, usually within a week or so. I usually recommend the first couple of days. You definitely don't want to wait too long because then you're likely to get a cramped swarm starting and that is a difficult thing to dissuade once the process has been started. So uh, usually within the first two or three days of getting your nuke back, you'll put them into their full-sized hive. Now, depending on the time of year and what other equipment you're putting them in that hive with, and what I mean by that is whether those frames are drawn or blank, um, that will you know, change the amount of care you have to give them. If you're giving them five blank frames and it's the beginning of spring, you are likely going to have to feed them. So feed more or air on the side of more rather than less when you're getting a hive started um, and feed you know, until the majority of the brood area has been built up. We'll talk more about feeding later on. So the first month for your package is once again way more involved. Um, so you install them, and let's say you installed them on a Monday. Uh, four days later, on Friday, uh, you will have to go back into that hive and carefully remove the frame that had the queen cage attached to it. She will likely have been chewed out through the candy hole. I didn't even mention that. 
Okay, so when you do install your, your uh, package, on one side of the queen cage is a hole that's plugged with candy. Generally, it's also plugged with a piece of cork that you have to remove. So when you're installing your package, remove the cork on the candy side of the queen cage. And then, four days later, get back in and inspect to see that your queen has been released. If she has not been released and this is your first time dealing with a package, just put the stuff back in and wait two more days. She's likely to be released in that time and you don't have to really worry about trying to free her from that cage. Um, but if she is free of the cage, what you have to do then is take the rubber band out and remove that cage from this frame. If you don't remove that cage from this frame, they will build comb around it and then you're likely not going to ever get a nice, beautiful sheet of comb like this because it was started off with a queen cage in the center. And that can cause issues of trying to push your frames all together nicely and all that. So make sure you get in four days later to remove that queen cage. The four days uh, from installing them to removing the queen cage, always make sure their feeder is full. And for the next month, always make sure their feeder is full. Um, once again, you're going to be surprised at how much syrup your bees can drink, but keep the syrup on them uh, because they need that to start building the wax and building up their brood nest. <clears throat> okay, so after you remove that queen cage four days after in installing your package, uh, wait at least 10 days after that before getting in to actually inspect your bees. The reason for that is any chaos directly after installing them can sort of make the bees blame the queen for the chaos. So in a lot of instances when people get into their bees too often right directly after installing them, they'll see supersedure cells, which are queen cells that indicate the bees are likely to replace that queen because something's not right. So give them at least 10 days after removing that queen cage before inspecting them. Uh, and we'll talk about proper inspections and all that uh, later on in this second part of the crash. The things you're looking for when you get into your package during your first month, uh, 10 days after removing that queen cage, your first inspection will be to check to see that they're drawing wax. Um, so you'll start to see stuff like this with uh, the wax starting to protrude from the sides of the frames. And also that your queen has started to build a brood nest. Um, now at this stage, it's not going to be anything really but eggs, and eggs sort of look like a miniaturized piece of rice sitting up on its end in the bottom of a cell. If you see that during your first inspection, you know that this is going well, your bees are doing what they should be doing, and you close them back up and let them go for another 10 days, keeping the syrup on them. Um, in your second inspection, now 20 days after removing that queen cage, you're going to see uh, more brood and brood in different stages. You're likely to start seeing the beginnings of capped brood. You'll see larvae of all different stages. Uh, and once again, probably and hopefully see signs that they are building out and drawing more wax as it becomes necessary. And then another inspection 10 days after, so that now it's 30 days after uh, removing that queen cage, you'll get into your bees and see that the capped cells have started to emerge as adult bees. And this is the end of your starting your hive period. Uh, at this point, your hive is now established and they will grow in population and you should consider them a colony that needs regular maintenance in terms of adding space and making certain that they're not getting swarm ready and all that. So after that third inspection, your colony is good, and uh, like I said, you can, you, you can start your normal, regular beekeeping activities. Okay, so this is the end of the second portion of our beekeeping crash course. Um, the next portion is going to be very important. It's on hive management, inspecting your bees, and feeding, and all that awesome stuff that we have to do as a beekeeper. So I hope you guys are digging this stuff. Um, I hope it's a little warmer for you guys so you can get out and have some fun with your bees. So thanks for watching.